When we talk about the Spartan military, discussions almost universally focus on their citizen hoplites. Famous units like the 300 Royal Guard and even your average Spartiate warrior claim all the glory, distracting us from the critical role played by the rest of the army. Diving into our sources, we actually find that victory often depended on one non-Spartan unit in particular, the Skiritai. Known to be first into war and last to retreat, they were a crack force whose particular set of skills acquired over a long career made them a nightmare for enemies of Sparta. Today, let us take a closer look at this mysterious warrior elite. This video was sponsored by Magellan TV. They're an awesome documentary streaming service run by filmmakers with a selection of over 3,000 videos to choose from among the categories of history, science, nature, space, and more. When it comes to history documentaries, Magellan TV has the richest and most varied content anywhere. Ancient, modern, current, war, biography, and even related genres like science and crime, which are historical in nature. You can learn more about elite forces through the ages with their series Top 10 Warfare, which covers fascinating units like the French Foreign Legion and the SAS. Magellan TV is compatible with Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Google Play, and iOS, which means you can watch it anytime, anywhere on your television, laptop, or mobile device. Sign up today to get 30% off an annual membership, which starts with a two-week free trial. That's less than $3.50 a month for access to thousands of documentaries. The offer is available for both new and returning users, so be sure to click the link in the description below or go to try.magellantv.com slash Invicta. Enjoy. The Skiritai are named after their homeland, the Skiritis. This is a rugged mountainous area of about 100 square kilometers on the border between the Spartans to the south and its northern neighbor, Tegea. At the time, it did not contain any cities, being composed instead of several small hilltop communities and was not organized as a typical Greek city-state. For a time, they seemed to have kept to themselves, but were inevitably drawn into the squabbles of their neighbors. For instance, the Spartans to the south and the Tegeans to the north fought from the 6th century BCE onwards. In these matters, the buffer region of Skiritis proved key and would have been an important area that either side sought to bring into their sphere of influence. We don't know exactly when Sparta first lay claim to the territory, but it seems that by the 5th century BCE, Skiritis was considered part of Laconia. The Skiritai, however, were not Spartans. Some ancient sources are confused about this, but the ones with inside information clearly separate the Skiritai from the general levy of Lacedaemonian Perioikoi, the freeborn, non-citizen population of Laconia. Rather, the Skiritai were Arcadians and throughout antiquity would continue to see themselves as such. This group was among the oldest in Greece having long inhabited the interior highland region of the Peloponnese. The relative isolation helped protect them from the changing demographics of the surrounding coastal plains. As such, the Arcadians had different customs and even spoke a different dialect of Greek than their neighbors. The Skiritai, therefore, were actually more culturally related to the Arcadian Tegeans to the north than to the Doric Spartans to the south. This meant that even though the Skiritai were an ordinary part of the Spartan militia, they were effectively foreigners in Spartan service. It may be because of the ethnic difference that the Skiritai always remained a distinct unit in Spartan armies, rather than blending into the phalanx, like the typical perioikoi. For instance, when the Spartans raised the militia for a campaign, other communities in Laconia would send their men to stand in the ranks with the Spartiates. But the men of the Skiritis would fight separately, as if they were allies and not subjects of Sparta. The cohesion of their small local levy, fixed at a strength of 600 men, made them a convenient force to use in roles for which large masses of hoplites were not well suited. 
Over time, the Skiritai would take on a growing range of responsibilities, becoming one of the most hard-working and essential elements of a Spartan army in the field. There is a lot about the Skiritai that we simply don't know, and one of the biggest questions is how they were equipped. Their range of roles on campaign and in battle does not fit those of any other warrior type known from classical Greece. The easiest solution is to assume that their equipment and fighting style changed over time, but even that doesn't answer all our questions. The earliest evidence for the Skiritai comes from the historian Thucydides, who states that they traditionally held the left wing of the Spartan battle line. It is possible that this emerged after the Greek victory against the Persians at Plataea, when the Tegeans, Sparta's Arcadian neighbors, had been awarded the position to the left of the Spartan line. Perhaps the Skiritai, who were not attested at Plataea, took on this honor after the Persian wars were over. After all, this was a very important position, given that one of the simplest and most common Greek battle plans was to outflank the enemy left wing with an extended right wing, and to roll up the line from there. Battles therefore often hinged on whether the troops on the far left of the line would stand their ground. From the fact that the Skiritai were traditionally deployed there, we can reasonably assume that they were trusted to hold their own ground. Doing so is quite difficult as a ranged or skirmishing force, and so they must have been able to close into hand-to-hand -hand combat. Following this line of thinking, they must therefore have been equipped as hoplites. Such conjecture is reasonable since the Arcadians had a reputation for their skill at hoplite fighting, and Arcadia would later become the main recruiting ground for mercenary hoplites. It is therefore understandable that the Spartans should have expected the Arcadian Skiritai to perform well in their role on the left flank. So what does this all mean in terms of equipment? Well, by the time Thucydides writes about them in the Peloponnesian War, Hoplites in Spartan service tended to be lightly equipped. For defense, they often wore a linen cuirass and a conical, open-faced pylos helmet. Their main source of protection was the large, round, double-grip shield called the Aspis. Freed helots carried the uniform Spartan shield blazon. The Lambda and the Skiritai may have done so as well. For offense, they carried a thrusting spear about 2 to 2.5 meters long, with a leaf-shaped iron spearhead and a bronze butt spike. As a secondary weapon, they may have carried either a makaira, slashing sword, or a double-edged short sword. After the Peloponnesian War, though, the role of the Skiritai seems to have changed. They are no longer described as the unit on the extreme left of the phalanx. Instead, the historian Xenophon who was good friends with the Spartan king, says that the Skiritai now advanced ahead of the Spartan marching column, with the cavalry to scout the way and sniff out enemy ambushes. He also says they guarded the camp at night. This was a clear sign of Sparta's trust in the loyalty and skills of these Arcadian soldiers. But even that doesn't answer all our questions. Beyond a mention of the use of thrusting spears by centuries, he tells us nothing about the equipment of the Skiritai. A much later source, the historian Diodorus Siculus, claims that the Skiritai were attached to the kings as a mobile reserve to respond rapidly to any crisis situation in battle. But again, he does not say what weapons they used. Some have argued that the new mobile Skiritai must have been mounted troops. If so, they would have been equipped as light cavalry, probably without armor, with either Petassos sun hats or Boeotian-style helmets on their heads, and with no more than a lance and perhaps a few javelins to use in combat. But most scholars have assumed that their new tactical role must mean that the Skiritai had become some form of specialist light infantry. In other armies, working together with the cavalry to protect the marching column was the job of peltasts, light-armed warriors with javelins and small shields. 
This fighting style was common to the more rugged parts of the Greek mainland, where towns and their militias were smaller and where forming large hoplite formations was difficult. The Skiritsai may have taken to light-armed fighting naturally. It also filled a niche within the Spartan army. The Spartiates themselves specialized in hoplite service. But they also made increasing efforts to raise a strong force of cavalry. What they lacked was a mobile force of missile infantry. The Skiritsai, as a distinct part of their militia, may have been reformed to meet that need. Surviving sculpture shows there was indeed a unique type of light infantry on the Spartan side, and these may be the Skiritsai we are looking for. If this is correct, then it seems they carried a pylos helmet but no body armor. Instead of the common crescent-shaped pelter shield, they wore a thick animal skin over their left arm for protection, its paws tied around their neck to hold it in place. They were armed with a thrusting spear and may also have carried some javelins, making them a flexible fighting force. However, it's important to remember that we are working with very little concrete evidence here. It is not certain that the Skiritsai were indeed light infantry, and if so, that they were equipped this way. They may very well have been hoplite troops who merely acted outside of the battle line. They may have been horsemen, or they may have been some other kind of force that is not so easily classified. Unfortunately, it's impossible to be sure. Similar uncertainty clouds the topic of their training and tactics. We do not know if they trained at all, or if they relied mostly on practical experience, like other Greek militias. From the evidence we do have, though, it is quite clear that the Skiritai were not a standing force, but rather a regional levy raised only when the Spartans called up the whole army for war. The men who formed the Skiritai in wartime were therefore primarily farmers and shepherds in peacetime. The wealthy among them may have exercised regularly, but the poorer levies would have been too busy putting food on the table. Their only preparation for war was normal, everyday life, which accustomed them to long days of hard work in rough terrain. Outside Sparta, as a rule, typical Greek militias did not train for war in a regular manner. Yet the Arcadians may have been a partial exception. Arcadian war dances were more like formation drills than those of other Greek communities, and the Arcadian city of Mantinea actually seems to have organized some collective training for hoplites, which was otherwise quite rare. If the Skiritai had similar customs, it would have made it easier for them to serve alongside the more well-trained Spartan phalanx. Yet once their role on campaign shifted from pitched battle to screening duties, this kind of hoplite training would no longer have been very useful. What they needed for their duty as the vanguard of the marching column was the opportunistic tactics of light-armed infantry. These troops moved aggressively against any exposed target, like lighter troops or enemies caught out of formation. Their jobs included seizing heights and strong positions, driving off enemy missile troops and chasing down routed foes. At the same time, they had to be fit and agile enough to withdraw the instant they spotted troops they couldn't handle, like formed hoplites or horsemen. They had to be able to move quickly in loose swarms, make quick decisions based on the terrain and the enemies they faced, and to work closely with friendly cavalry. To some extent, the life of shepherds in the Skiritis would have prepared them for this style of fighting but the rest had to be learned when the army set out for war. In this regard, there would have been no shortage of opportunities. According to Xenophon, the Spartans used the Skiritai constantly while on campaign, sparing them neither from hard work nor danger, always making sure it was the Skiritai who bore the brunt of any task, and not the Spartans themselves. When we turn to the service history of the Skiritai, we run into another serious problem. Almost everything the ancient Greeks tell us about this unit is a generalization. 
Thucydides says they always held the left wing in battle. Xenophon says they always marched ahead of the king and guarded the camp at night. Theodorus says they were always in reserve, ready to fight when needed. Such contradictory statements would be great to cross-check against a detailed service history, but unfortunately we have but two concrete examples of the Scyrati in action. The first of these is the Battle of Mantinea in 418 BCE. Here, Sparta was fighting to keep its supremacy in the Peloponnese against a challenge from their eternal rival, Argos. In this battle, the Scyrati held the extreme left of the Spartan line, with a detachment of veteran mercenaries to their right, followed by the main Spartan levy. The maneuvers of the battle put the Scyrati in an impossible position. Aegis, the Spartan king, was afraid that the enemy would outflank his left, so he ordered the Scyrati and the mercenaries to march further to the left to prevent it. This opened up a gap in the line. Aegis intended to plug it with units from his right, but these units thought the plan was bad and refused to move. With no other option, Aegis sent an order for the Scyrati to march back and close the gap, but it was already too late. The Mantineans and Argives on the enemy right poured into the gap and surrounded the isolated Scyrati and mercenaries, who broke under the pressure and fled. Aegis managed to win the battle with the rest of his army, but the Scyrati had been decimated. Nearly all the losses Sparta suffered that day were from the two units on the left of the line. Despite Thucydides' generalizing claim, this is the last time we see the Scyrati play a role in pitched battle. The only other occasion where the Scyrati are seen in action at all is during one of the Spartan invasions of Theban territory four decades later, in 377 BCE, during the Boeotian War. On this occasion, the Theban army had taken up position on a hill. The Spartan king, Agesilaus, decided not to attack them there, but instead to make straight for Thebes itself. Seeing him advancing, the Thebans panicked and rushed back through the hills to the city. The Spartans attacked parts of the Theban army as it ran past, driving them off hill after hill. As they neared Thebes, the Scyrati and the cavalry took the lead. They rushed to the top of the hill near the city rained missiles down on the fleeing Thebans and pursued them right down to the city wall. But when they reached the wall, the Theban militia rallied and the Scyrati wisely broke off their pursuit just in time. They did not lose a single man. It was a flawless harrying operation. It showed the capabilities of the well-managed force of experienced light troops that the Scyrati had become. We never see the Scyrati in action again after this. Even when the Spartans were defending the Scyrtis from invasion, the garrison they placed there to guard the pass from Tegea did not include the Scyrtai themselves. But we can be sure that they served whenever Sparta called out the ban. As Spartan power waned and their manpower resources dwindled, they would have leaned more and more heavily on local levies like the 600 Scyrtai. Their long experience fighting in Sparta's wars would have made them an invaluable, flexible force. But it did not take long for the Spartans to lose this asset as well. After Philip of Macedon's victory over the Greeks at Chironia in 338 BCE, he marched south into the Peloponnese. The Spartans famously rebuffed his threats but did nothing to stop him when he stripped away the last of their ancient conquests, leaving Sparta a rump state that controlled only the valley of the Eurotas. The lands he liberated included the Scyrtis, which became a free Arcadian community for the first time in more than 200 years. It's at this point that the faithful Scyrtai finally stopped serving the Spartans and disappeared from the pages of history. We hope you've enjoyed this exploration of the lesser-known aspect of the Spartan roster. Let us know what other units of history you would like to see covered next.
A huge thanks is owed to our patrons for funding the channel and to the researchers, writers and artists who made this episode possible. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content and check out these other related videos. Thanks for watching.